Hi folks, I'm Leon Little and I'm Owl About Stories. I read them, write them, watch them, anything with a story, I absolutely love it. I especially love sharing them with other people and what better way is there to start than with the classics? They're classics for a reason, right? They're amazing stories and absolutely timeless. Don't forget to hit up all those fancy buttons. Like, subscribe, follow, share, whatever you need to do. But most importantly, don't be afraid to reach out. I'd love to connect with you, so feel free to leave comments as you'd like, or you can even follow me over on my Buy Me A Coffee page, leannelittle.com, to message directly. So let's continue on with The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 112, The Departure. The recent events formed the theme of conversation throughout all Paris. Emmanuel and his wife conversed with natural astonishment in their little apartment in the Rue Malay upon three successive, sudden, and most unexpected catastrophes of Morsif, Danglars, and Villefort. Maximilian, who was paying them a visit, listened to their conversation, or rather was present at it, plunged in his accustomed state of apathy. Indeed, said Julie. We might not almost fancy, Emmanuel, that those people, so rich, so happy but yesterday, had forgotten in their prosperity that an evil genius, like the wicked fairies in Perrault's stories who present themselves unbidden at a wedding or baptism, hovered above them and appeared all at once to revenge himself for their fatal neglect. What a dire misfortune, said Emmanuel, thinking of Morsif and Danglars. What dreadful suffering, said Julie, remembering Valentine but whom, with a delicacy natural to women, she did not name before her brother. If the supreme being has directed the fatal blow, said Emmanuel, it must be he, in his great goodness, has perceived nothing in the past lives of these people to merit mitigation of their awful punishment. Do you not form a very rash judgment, Emmanuel? said Julie. When my father, with a pistol in his hand, was once on the point of committing suicide, had anyone then said, this man deserves his misery? Would not that person have been deceived? Yes, but your father was not allowed to fall. A being was commissioned to arrest the fatal hand of death about to descend on him. Emmanuel had scarcely uttered these words when the sound of the bell was heard, the well-known signal given by the porter that a visitor had arrived. Nearly at the same instant the door was opened and the Count of Monte Cristo appeared on the threshold. The young people uttered a cry of joy, while Maximilian raised his head, but let it fall again immediately. Maximilian said the Count, without appearing to notice the different impressions which his presence produced on the little circle. I come to seek you. To seek me? repeated Morel, as if awakening from a dream. Yes, said Monte Cristo. Has it not been agreed that I should take you with me, and did I not tell you yesterday to prepare for departure? I am ready, said Maximilian. I came expressly to wish them farewell. Whither are you going, Count? asked Julie. In the first instance, to Marseilles, madame. To Marseilles, exclaimed the young couple. Yes, and I take your brother with me. Oh, Count, said Julie, will you restore him to us cured of his melancholy? Morel turned away to conceal the confusion of his countenance. You perceive then that he is not happy, said the Count. Yes, replied the young woman, and fear much that he finds our home but a dull one. I will undertake to divert him, replied the Count. I am ready to accompany you, sir, said Maximilian. Adieu, my kind friends. Emmanuel, Julie, farewell. How farewell, exclaimed Julie. Do you leave us thus so suddenly without any preparations for your journey, without even a passport? Needless delays but increase the grief of parting, said Monte Cristo. And Maximilian doubtless proved himself with everything requisite. At least I advised him to do so. I have a passport my clothes are ready packed, said Morel in his tranquil but mournful manner. Good, said Monte Cristo, smiling. In these prompt arrangements, we recognize the order of a well-disciplined soldier. And you leave us at a moment's warning? You do not give us a day, no, not even an hour before your departure. My carriage is at the door, madame, and I must be in Rome in five days. But does Maximilian go to Rome? exclaimed Emmanuel. I am going wherever it may please the Count to take me, said Morel with a smile full of grief. I am under his orders for the next month. Oh, heavens, how strangely he expresses himself, Count, said Julie. Maximilian goes with me, said the Count in his kindest and most persuasive manner. Therefore, do not make yourself uneasy on your brother's account. Once more, farewell, my dear sister. Emmanuel, adieu, Morel repeated. His carelessness and indifference touches me to the heart, said Julie. Oh, Maximilian, Maximilian, 
You are certainly concealing something from us. Pshaw, said Monte Cristo. You will see him return to you gay, smiling, and joyful. Maximilian cast a look of disdain, almost of anger on the Count. We must leave you, said Monte Cristo. Before you quit us, Count, said Julie, will you permit us to express to you all that the other day, Madame, interrupted the Count, taking her two hands in his, all that you could say in words would never express what I read in your eyes. The thoughts of your heart are fully understood by mine. Like benefactors and romances, I should have left you without seeing you again. But that would have been a virtue beyond my strength, because I am a weak and vain man, fond of the tender, kind, and thankful glances of my fellow creatures. On the eve of departure, I carry my egotism so far as to say, do not forget me, my kind friends, for probably you will never see me again. Never see you again? exclaimed Emmanuel, while two large tears rolled down Julie's cheeks. Never behold you again? It is not a man, then, but some angel that leaves us, and this angel is on the point of returning to heaven after having appeared on earth to do good. Say not so, quickly returned Monte Cristo. Say not so, my friends. Angels never err. Celestial beings remain where they wish to be. Fate is not more powerful than they. It is they who, on the contrary, overcome fate. No, Emmanuel, I am but a man, and your admiration is unmerited as your words are sacrilegious. Pressing his lips on the hand of Julie, who rushed into his arms, he extended the other to Emmanuel, then tearing himself from this abode of peace and happiness, he made a sign to Maximilian, who followed him passively, with the indifference which had been perceptible in him ever since the death of Valentine had so stunned him. Restore my brother to peace and happiness, whispered Julie to Monte Cristo, and the Count pressed her hand in reply as he had done eleven years before on the staircase leading to Morel's study. You still confide, then, in Sinbad the sailor? he asked, smiling. Oh, yes, was the ready answer. Well, then, sleep in peace and put your trust in the Lord. As we have before said, the post-chaise was waiting. The four powerful horses were already pawing at the ground with impatience, while Ali, apparently just arrived from a long walk, was standing at the foot of the steps, his face bathed in perspiration. Well, asked the Count in Arabic, have you been to see the old man? Ali made a sign in the affirmative. And have you placed the letter before him? as I ordered you to do. The slave respectively signaled that he had. And what did he say, or rather do? Ali placed himself in the light, so that his master might see him distinctly, and then imitating in his intelligent manner the countenance of the old man, he closed his eyes, as Noirtier was in the custom of doing when saying yes. Good, he accepts, said Monte Cristo. Now, let us go. These words had scarcely escaped him when the carriage was on its way, and the feet of the horses struck a shower of sparks from the pavement. Maximilian settled himself in his corner without uttering a word. Half an hour had passed when the carriage stopped suddenly. The Count had just pulled the silken check string, which was fastened to Ali's finger. The Nubian immediately descended and opened the carriage door. It was a lovely starlit night. They had just reached the top of the hill Villejeuf, from whence Paris appears like a somber sea tossing its millions of phosphoric waves into light. Waves indeed more noisy, more passionate, more changeable, more furious, more greedy than those of the tempestuous ocean. Waves which never rest as those of the sea sometimes do. Waves ever dashing, ever foaming, ever engulfing what falls within their grasp. The Count stood alone, and at a sign from his hand, the carriage went on for a short distance. With folded arms, he gazed for some time upon the great city. When he had fixed his piercing look on this modern Babylon, which equally engages the contemplation of the religious enthusiast, the materialist, the scoffer. Great city, murmured he, inclining his head, and joining his hands as if in prayer. Less than six months have elapsed since I first entered thy gates. I believe that the Spirit of God led my steps to thee, and that he also enables me to quit thee in triumph. The secret cause of my presence within thy walls I have confided alone, to him who only has had the power to read my heart. God only knows that I retire from thee without pride or hatred, but not without many regrets. He only